Hello, everybody. So here we are on day four of our uh, e-conference on responding to fall army worm in Africa. So far, we've had uh, a number of uh, discussions. So Monday afternoon, we were on fall army worm identification infestation. We then on, went on to monitoring and initial responses. Yesterday, we were also talking then about the recommended responses to fall army worm. And today, We've got uh, three different talks, actually, looking at different aspects related to breeding, to using um, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis technologies, and uh, to push-pull options. Um, I'm not absolute, we're not absolutely sure at the moment whether one of our speakers is going to be able to join us. He, he'd actually understood it. He was maybe speaking on a different day. Um, so we're going to shoot straight off with uh, Isaac. Uh, Oyediran from Syngenta, who will be talking on the, uh, the role of BT technology in sustainable agriculture and in fall armyworm responses. So Isaac holds a PhD from, uh, in agricultural entomology from the University of Nebraska. He's worked uh, for ITA, for Africa Rice and for Monsanto before he joined Syngenta. And he's currently uh, looking at insect traits uh, resistance management in, in North America. So I'll hand over then, Linda, if we could put uh, Isaac on uh, to speak to us first. We can't hear you yet, Isaac. If you can unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Go, can you? go ahead. I mean, that's sorry. Okay. <laughs> can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. And now okay. we can see your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Afternoon, good evening to all of you from where you're hearing me from. Uh, first of all, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Linda for making this uh, possible for me to give this uh, presentation. For the past three days, we've been talking about the strategies being employed in Africa to solve the fall army one problem. And because we, we are thinking holistically, I believe it's also necessary to talk about all the tools in the IPM toolbox. So today, I'll be talking to you about another tool in the IPM toolbox, the role of BT technologies, technology for sustainable agriculture and for animal responses. Uh, for today's uh, presentation, I'll talk about Syngenta vision, insect pest control, BT technology conclusion, and where do we go from here? Syngenta is one of the biggest art companies in the world. We have a headquarters and we are located all over the world. This slide shows our innovation center at uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, where all the traits are developed. And this is where I'm based. We have a state of the art greenhouse and uh, makes it possible for us to develop our traits. Our vision is to help small and large farms to meet the global food security. As we know, it's been projected that uh, the population of the sub-Saharan sub uh, region will, will, will grow. And as a result of that, we need to have ways to improve the way we do uh, food pr production to be uh, the teeming population and also make sure that we are uh, uh, not harming the environment. This is Syngenta at, 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 at a glance. This is what we do. We work on different uh, crops. We have the best chemistry. We work on corn, soybean, cereals, diverse crops, specialty crops, vegetables, rice, sugarcane, lawn and garden. We have the best seed care, seeds and traits. In the U.S., because we're talking about corn, I just want to show you 
some of the pests. In the U.S., corn production is really affected by a complex of insects that are classified into above ground and below ground. For the above ground, you have fall anyone, southwest corn borer, European corn borer, corn worm, West Indian catworm, and below ground are the rootworms, and then the uh, black catworm. We've seen a lot of slides on the, the damage caused by uh, fall worm. I just wanted to show some of this. At times, some people think fall worm only feeds on the leaves, but uh, uh, that's not true. Fall worm feels, feeds almost on every plant tissue except the stalks. If you look at the left, my on my own right panel, you see the damage down to the ears. At times, when people see this, they think it's uh, damage caused by cornea worm, but this is also uh, the damage that uh, cornea worm can, I mean, fall worm can cause. We've heard about all the management tactics, cultural, biological, chemical, and today I want to focus my attention on the post plant resistant, which BT technology is a part. The reason for that is that uh, the plant produces the toxin, and as we know, one of the uh, one of the host plant resistant uh, action is the uh, antibiotics. So the plant produces the toxin, and then when the insect feeds on that toxin, the, the insects now die. In the U.S., uh, various classes of BT technologies have been commercialized for over two decades. We have the cry. The cry means crystalline. It's a crystalline form that actually uh, kills the insect. We have the crystalline plus one in uh, BT toxins, crystalline plus two BT toxins, crystalline three. And then the last one, Vitorite, is a unique one. It's a vegetative insecticidal protein. All the plus one to two and Vitorite are very efficacious against Lepidopterans and then the class threes are very efficacious against the uh, coleopterans. For any BT trait to be effective, it has to be expressed, produced at the required concentration throughout the plant growth cycle. As you can see, this slide just shows you how the expression is throughout the growth cycle. The expression increases as the plant matures. And at silences, the toxin the expression drops. So there's no expression of the gene at the uh, harvest. So you need to have the expression of this gene throughout the plant. We have high expressors, we have low expressors, and then we have medium expressors. But most of the time, we go for those uh, plants that express the high concentration of the protein. This slide shows are one of the best traits that Syngenta has. It controls almost all the above ground uh, insects. As you can see, the ears from this uh, tray is really clean compared to the one on your left here. And then the plants are also very clean. clean. There's no damage. It protects fall army one, protects all of that insects and then you have a higher green quality because of the damage that is incurred, infringed on the kennels. The kennels are predisposed to uh, disease mycotoxin. So because of the protection that this trait offers to the ears, there is the reduction of uh, aflatoxin and mycotoxin. This slide just shows you what we have compared to our competitors. Agrisho Victor is great, and we provide excellent all the lepidopteran pests that are known compared to other competitors' uh, products. So uh, Agrisho Victor is really very good. It controls almost all the lepid attack corn. This is just to show you the adoption of uh, uh, BT traits in the US. As you can see, for the past 22 or 21 years, the adoption of uh, BT traits has really increased. 
We have over 80% of the corn that is grown in the U.S. being BT, about 90% being soybeans, cotton. So you can see there's a, 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 an increase in the adoption of this uh, technology. And the growers are making money out of that, and, us, and that's why the adoption rate is ticking upward. Now, with respect to the African uh, agricultural production system, where the farmers are smallhold farmers, there's miscropping, poor soils, insects and diseases, which is the topic of uh, discussion for this uh, conference, weeds, drought, and low yields. The discussion this week has been army wounds. And this just to show you the, some of the damage uh, down to a lot of this uh, damage being done by fall animal. Currently in Africa, we have monitoring, scouting, pheromone, traps, light traps, chemical. The advantage that BT has over all this is that you don't have to scout your plant, your field when you plant your BT. The BT, the plant, manufactures the toxin. So there's no need for scouting, no need for monitoring pheromone traps, light traps, and then there's a reduction in the chemical using. You know, when you scout and you are finding larvae in your field, you know that uh, the whole field must have been, you know, infested with uh, the fall army wound. So BT technology has uh, uh, an advantage because it expresses the gene throughout the plant cycle. So how will the BT benefit Africa? It can benefit Africa to improve uh, the production of corn, rice, soybeans, sugarcane. And right now, the companies are working on drought tolerance improve yield, farm product, uh, profitability, increase security, and also drought tolerance. For any BT trade to be durable, you must have resistance management plans. You can prevent uh, resistance to develop to any control measure. You can delay it. So we have all kinds of resistance management plans to or delay the evolution of uh, resistance. And one of that is the uh, refuge uh, plant. You plant portion of the field to a non-BT so that susceptible insects can mate with any resistant insect coming out from the BT. This slide is just to show you the adoption of uh, GMOs around the world. As you can see, over 26 countries 19 countries in the developing worlds. I've had the opportunity to travel to many of these developing worlds and uh, the way farming is done has changed. All the small boat farmers are really enjoying the BT technology and they are making uh, money out of it. Africa has already joined activities going on in Nigeria, East Africa, and then we even have uh, uh, a location in South Africa where we sell uh, BT trades. Yesterday, I was uh, I received this uh, newsletter just to tell you that African countries are making efforts to assess this technology. So, in the conclusion, the BT trade is very good. It's non-toxic. Is first specific to the insect pests. There is reduction in the insecticide use suitable for small scale farmers. It benefits the environment, increased income yield through high yields, and you have healthier grains. So, what is the way for? I mean, we have to deploy this in a safe way. We have to also have uh, work in the partnership with the African government to create a policy and a nice environment that will allow for the commercialization of this trade and then create awareness around this trade. And also the government should work in conjunction with the universities, internet, uh, research institutes to generate their own data so that they'll be able to make a determination whether they want to accept or not to accept. 
but not just giving them the opportunity to assess this technology will not be too good. So I always try as much as possible to talk about this because being an African, I have seen in other parts where smallhold farmers have made a lot of uh, progress. I think it would be good for Africans to be allowed to assess this uh, trade. And with that, I will be able to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. So thanks very much indeed, uh, Isaac. Very clear presentation, nice and, uh, nice and short. And one of the questions which was asked ahead of the conference already was um, to what extent that BT technologies, well, on, on the one hand, how, how effective are they specifically against fall armyworm? And on the other side, how widely available they are? Now, you already maybe hinted at, 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 uh, at both of these, but maybe you could just repeat, uh, because those are two of the things which, which participants were really very keen to understand. I thank you very much. I think that's a very good question. Uh, the BT technology is very, very, very effective against fall army war in the US. And uh, other insects too, for the past 20 years, you've not seen any outbreak in the fall, fall army one population. So the BT trade has been very effective, not only against fall army one, but against other insect pests. I think the availability of, I think what we are lacking in Africa is the policy, institutional policy that will make it possible for the trace to be commercialized. In South Africa, for example, they have a well developed uh, regulatory system. You have to regulate, you have to have an oversight to regulate this because you are dealing with something that has uh, genes and you don't want it to just get into hands without regulation. So it's available. I think we can work with governments, um, you know, work with governments on how they can actually assess this technology. The key is have the oversight, the regulatory uh, mechanism by which these rates can be uh, launched. So it's readily available. I mean, it's readily available. Yeah. The governments have to do their own part. Okay, and I mean, I think you made the you made it very clear in your introduction that, in a sense, you you overcome the need for for crop scouting and things because you've already got the the resistance built in, in the yes. so as soon as the caterpillars start to bite, that they uh, they're actually killed directly. Um, yes. Can we go back though to this whole issue of uh, of registration because I think this is one that that um, I I certainly at times find confusing. Yes. And I know that, um, in fact, I've been involved in, in, in discussions and debates about the deployment of G crops globally. And yes. um, there, there are, as you already pointed out, there are, in, in your map, the, the blue countries were countries that have already approved um, field testing, I think beyond laboratory testing, yes. field testing of different um, traits. And I think in that uh, biotech uptake from yesterday, you suggested that Kenya had actually now approved BT cotton. But is that actually now approved beyond the um, experimental phase, actually into usage? Yeah. You mean the, the cotton? Yeah, now it's in the experimental phase. So but, they will now generate the data, the package, and then they will have to put in the a structure that will oversee what the data experimental phase is different from commercialization. You so, have to do the experimental phase. But so far, then, again, so just to be clear, so so far, none of these technologies yes. have gone actually into deployment phase, or, or, or they no, in, no. In South Africa, we have uh, one ABE, two ABE that oh. have been deployed in corn and cotton. In oh. Sudan, we have a uh, uh, Bulgar in book. In the fast, they had both So, in all these African countries, like in the South Africa, we have the deployment of uh, uh, this uh, BT trace. We have Cry 1A BT 11, and then uh, 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 Boga, I, I mean, uh, Cry 2 in South Africa. In South Africa, it, it's been uh, deployed, commercialized, 
and people are buying and, and, and planting there. So <laughs> it is in other countries sure. that they are doing experiments and so then to generate the data and then... Okay, so we have, have maybe to follow on then. Sorry for pushing yes. this. I think it's a point that we need to try and get clear. How, how long will it, will it, is it likely to take in the countries that are still just going into the experimental testing phase? before the varieties are like to be registered and, and released for use? I, I think if you have uh, at least two years data to be sure that what you want to deploy is working in that environment, you have to be sure, generate the data that is required and also have the, uh, you know, the regulatory agencies ready to see what you have. So with two years data, field data, and then the package that you have to present the dossier. You have to do the, uh, the efficacy, the risk assessment, the effect of that on, uh, on, on the environment and also uh, safety issues. All those needs to be, uh, you know, ironed out. So that will also depend on how fast the governments are willing to do these uh, sure. studies. Okay. So there's there's one question here, um, yeah. which is basically what's the relationship between BT and GMO? And, and I think we have just to be clear <laughs> that, that BT is a genetically engineered trait in crops. Yes. But, but there are You're a, a number of much more specific uh, questions coming in. First of all, yes. uh, John Komen is telling us that BT cotton is currently in national performance trials in Kenya. And I think that's what you're oh. in yourself. Before yes. formal registration. And okay. the same person is actually asking which BT maize events are uh, the most effective against fall armyworm in South Africa. If you have any more detailed information on which, uh, which of the maize events are most effective. I think right now in South Africa we have BT11. The BT11 is uh, Cry 1AB is very effective. And then there's another one that will be launched very soon. That will be a stack of three traits. You have Cry 1AB, you have 2AB, and then you have Viptera. So for now, what we have is, is uh, uh, I'm talking from a uh, Syngenta standpoint, we yeah. have uh, BT11. BT11 is what we are selling right now. But then in the nearest future, we intend to deploy a tree stack pyramid uh, event okay. that has Viptera. Yeah, so right now, uh, I, I also want to, uh, you know, talk about, somebody talk about resistance. Before any tree is launched, we do a, a, to see what should be the durability for how long yeah. will this tree be in the market. I've been there for over 10 years, which has been uh, the, the, the model. The model predicted that a single trade would be in the market for over 10 years. And right now, because they have stayed for 10 years, we are trying to bring in stacks, you know, to complement the uh, efforts of the single trade. Sure. So currently in South Africa, we have cry one ab which is BT11. But uh, very soon, we'll be deploying a three-way stack event that has the best trade against fall armyworm. Vitera is the best trade against fall armyworm in right now in the market. So maybe just for the people who are less expert in this field, when you're talking about stacking, then you're putting in multiple uh, copies exactly. together, which actually gives you a much better and more durable resistance. So specifically on that question, there's a question from Pierre Sylvie who's saying yes. about the, the CRY 1F resistance to fall armyworm in Puerto Rico. Do you, are you aware of this? Yes, thank you very much. I, I know that question will come. And then what happened in Puerto Rico was that, like I said in my presentation, that uh, for every uh, for every any BT tree to be durable, you have to uh, have IRM uh, rules. And what happened in Puerto Rico was that because the BT trade was given enough income, most of the growers were not abiding with the uh, IRM uh, uh, plant. They were cultivating, uh, they were cultivating cry 1F year in, year out without planting the refuge. So it was a perfect environment. 
there was no refuge, uh, non BT plants to produce the susceptibles that, that were made with. And also, they were, they were planting corn year in, year out in areas where they had irrigation. So there were multiple generations of the uh, cry one f uh, 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 resistant insect. But that has been solved. Viptera controls the cry one f resistant uh, insects in uh, Puerto Rico. Yes, we've, we know that there's a cry one f resistance there. But the problem, what led to that was that the growers were not abiding with the IRM uh, plants that were that they were asked to do. They were just planting without planting the refuge. Okay. So we so, have to be yeah. very careful. But I mean, I think this is a yeah. very important point then, because what you're what you're telling us is it's not just a matter of deploying the varieties and 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 letting it. Yes, you, you have to actually make sure that you're managing how these varieties are used to ensure that resistance doesn't build up. I want to give you one, exactly. one more question before we go on to yes, sir. the presentation. <laughs> we'll come back yes. again at the end. So um, this question is one from uh, Lisette Lacambra, and she's asking, well, you've shown that, that acceptance is there in some countries, but how do you address this whole issue of, uh, of opposition to deploying of BT because of its uh, GMO nature? It's a, it's a question that we can't avoid, obviously. It's a, it's a very real one in some countries. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we have to do a good job uh, in educating uh, the people about the safety of GMOs. I want to assure our listeners that for any GMO that, uh, that, that, that is on the market in the US has gone through a lot of rigorous uh, 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 regulation. And most of the data that went into the approval came in from even university renowned laboratories. I think what is going on is that uh, there is there is lack of information. People know uh, know little about the GM, and that is where we have to create that awareness. And then I don't want to go into other folks too who are against the BT because. When you plant the BT, you will not be buying insecticide. We also have insecticide, so everything has to be in the, you know balance. We have to balance everything. But I think what is going on is that we need to speak about the importance of BT. For example, in the US, if you eat sweet corn, it's BT. If you bring solar, everything here is part of is BT. Okay. So we have to talk more about the safety and then the acceptance of uh, the BT technology. Sure. So basically it needs a much more open debate with in, in exactly. the public about the, uh, the, the the benefits and any potential risks. I, I, I'm going to break my point to give you one more question because uh, uh, I think it's a very specific one and that's uh, a question about well what what exactly. is the question? That's, the, that's, that's what we have to do and that's why I'm sorry the question from Belay Teresa Who's, who's asking, so what are the BT contents? What are the contents of BT maize? So maybe you can explain what is the resistance and how does it become, how does uh, maize become resistant then to fall armywear? Are you still with us? Linda, have we lost? Breaking. That? You are breaking. I can hear you very well. <laughs> And we can hear you again, so go ahead, Isaac. Sorry, maybe I'll repeat the question, Isaac. I think we, we, the, the connection dropped. Can? I think can? the connection dropped, yeah? Okay, I, I, you were breaking. I lost you completely, so I, that's why I was waving my hand. I didn't hear the last two. So so, you were going to ask a question, right? I'll repeat the question. So the question is from Belay Teresa. He's saying, what are the contents of BT May? So maybe you can explain uh, what gives the what, what confers the resistance in BT maize, and how then does maize become resistant? Now, how do, how does oh. fall armyworm sorry become resistant? Okay, okay. I think we are going into the development of uh, uh, the BT tree. It has to you know it's a long process. What you do is that 
you get uh, the bacteria from soil, and then you create a cassette, and then you do transformation. It's something that uh, I just, it, it's more than that, but you have to, uh, the molecular biologists will create that uh, cassette, and then they will introduce the gene into the cytoplasm of the plant, and then it picks it up, and then you have other processes. And then the successful uh, plant that makes made that will be the event. So it's not something I can just talk about right now. It's, maybe, it's a lot of... Maybe what we need to explain to Delay is that this is a, a toxin that's <laughs> found in the natural bacterium, which can then be put yep. within the plant. Yes, and transform into the plant. But then, with respect to resistance, yeah. uh, re in, any, in any population, you have different types of individuals. You have those that already have genes that can make them resistant to anything that you apply. So in a natural population, you have three phenotypes. You have, I mean, three, two phenotypes. You have the susceptibles, insects, those ones when you apply, when they feed on the BT, they die. And then you have some of them that are heterozygotes already in the population. They carry uh, a resistant gene. So no matter what you do, it also is similar to applying insecticide. So we repeat with repetition. When you plant a BT trait year in, year out, and you don't have the refuge, so you are creating a perfect environment. When you plant, it's like when you expose your insect to a repetitive insecticide spray. When you plant a BT uh, corn, year in, year out, and you are not abiding with the resistance management rules, you are creating a perfect situation for the insect to become resistant. Sure. So the insect becomes uh, comfortable, it detoxifies. There are so many mechanisms by which the insect can become resistant. Sure. Detoxification. It's a natural you know. evolution of resistance that happens in, in, in the pest. I'm, I'm going to stop there, uh, Isaac. Uh, thanks very, very much for, yes. for your presentation and for the answers to the questions. You'll stay with us, I understand, though, so that we can come back yes. Yes. later on. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. So now we're going to move on then to um, Charles Midega. So Charles is a senior research scientist at uh, ISIPE, uh, based in, uh, in Nairobi in Kenya. He holds a PhD in agricultural entomology from Kenyatta University and after, and has uh, done postdocs uh, in, in Japan. And he's also a distinguished Africanist scholar at Cornell University in the United States. Um, so today then, uh, Charles is going to be talking to us about the application of push-pull principles to the control of fall armyworm in, um, in maize in Africa. So, over to you, Charles. So, Linda, if you can put Charles on. So Charles, you'll need to unmute and uh, share your screen. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, Linda, can, can you see that? Yeah, we can hear you. And if you share your screen, then we can <laughs> see that as well. Oh, yes. Just, just a minute. This is the technology that is also confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you did this, it's like it's a new experience. Let me share this again. <laughs> okay. Um, can you now see my screen? Yeah, perfect. You go for the screen. Can you just, right, you just can you just click on the where it says hide on the on the oh, okay. okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Now, yeah, you're ready to go. Roll. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Linda and uh, Ken, for making this possible. Um, once again, I am Charles Midega. I work at the International Center of Insect Fishery Oncology, um, abbreviated as ECP, headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, ECP is an institute that uh, has a very unique mission that is helping alleviate poverty, um, ensuring food security, and improving overall health status of people of the tropics by developing and extending management tools and strategies for harmful and useful arthropods. And we do this uh, um, through research and capacity. But overall, we also want to preserve the natural base of these production systems. Uh, insects are critically important, and ECP is really the only in insect uh, center worldwide 
insects, you know, are important as vectors of diseases. Um, insects are important as pests of crops, like now we're talking about for lungworm. This is also um, um, important to us as uh, uh, insect food and feed. But again, we also have uh, the beneficial ones that also help in uh, pollination like bees and the others. Um, so for the sake of this talk today, we're talking about fall armyworm. Um, this is a new pest to Africa. And we've had this, this, this the presentations earlier covering where it came from, when it came in and the damage causes. I just wanted to point out that uh, um, just like Isaac has said, um, it doesn't just reduce the crop yield, uh, it also reduces the quality of the harvest um, because it does not only attack the leaves and uh, the growing parts, but also attacks the cob. That exposes the cob not only to the ear rot, but also the mycotoxins that contaminate uh, um, um, the produce. So there are also cases of uh, issues of aflatoxin um, emerging as being very serious as with the in uh, invasion of the continent by, by fall armyworm. But before the invasion of fall armyworm, we also had constraints in Africa that are uh, bedeviling the small scale farmers. Before we had the invasion, we had uh, um, stem borers as the key pests of cereal crops in much of Africa. And we also had uh, striga weeds, these beautifully flowered plants. Uh, they look beautiful, but highly devastating to, to small scale farmers. Um, unfortunately, the constraints, uh, um, the, the striga and the stem borers, uh, the severity of the constraints seemed to be worse under effects of uh, poor soil fertility and drought. Now, um, what is the push-pull system? Um, ECP and partners developed uh, a management approach to deal with the problems of uh, stem borers, problems of striker, and improve soil fertility while building the economic base of the farmer through a system that is called push-pull. Push-pull was basically developed by understanding the complex mechanisms that govern the interactions between insects pest beneficial um, organisms, where you use plants that are not liked by the insect to provide the repellents. So if you intercrop your cereal uh, field with these plants, they push away the pest. But around this intercrop, you plant uh, attractive plants, plants that emit volatiles that, uh, that uh, attract the pest. The, this combination um, provides a push and pull approach to the pest management by use of these plants that provide the push as the intercrop but then the pool is a trap plant that is planted around this intercrop. But the intercrop also has additional responsibilities, additional roles, one of which is suppression of striga. Striga weed is parasitic. That means the seeds, once they germinate, the emerging plant must find uh, the roots of a host plant. So the, there's root attachment between the host plant and, uh, and the parasite. So that is how it derives its nutrition. The problem with that is that then it causes a phototoxic effect on the plant, but also reduces uh, the yield significantly. Now, so push pull technology is basically a field that looks like this. You've got one cereal crop, but then you've got two perennial component plants. In between the rows of uh, uh, the cereal is the repellent plant, but then around this intercrop, crop, like I've already explained, is the trap plant. And uh, we have two variants of push pull. You've got the conventional push pull and the, drought, the climate smart push pull. The conventional push pull uses silver leaf desmodium as the push plant in between the rows of cereals, and napier grass around this intercrop as the pool plant. Both uh, the push and pool plants are beneficial for the, so it allows you to degrade uh, uh, crop production and, uh, and, and, uh, and livestock. We've gone ahead to adapt this system to dry areas, and so to speak, adapting, adapting to climate change, by identifying drought and component plants that provides the beneficial push and pull effects that we had with the conventional component plant. But this is applicable in much dry areas and we've recorded significant increases in grain yields, but also economic returns to the farmers. Now, um, this is what a climate smart push would look like, where you have be between the rows of sorghum that you see there, a, a green leaf desmodium that is highly drought tolerant, but around this intercrop you have uh, Bracaria mulato 2, which is a three-way hybrid. This is uh, highly effective as a trap plant around this intercrop, but again, at the same time, is is uh, highly valued fodder, so it, it improves uh, uh, crop product uh, livestock productivity as well. Now, how does push pull deliver its pest management benefits? Um, the first component is the pool plant around this intercrop. Um, we observed uh, from a series of studies that uh, napier grass was highly preferred for egg laying by the pest. Uh, so if you give the moth a choice between napier grass and, and maize, it will lay more eggs on napier grass than on the maize. Uh, and it did not matter what combination of plants, even if you uh, introduced napier grass where you had other host plants, napier grass would still be preferentially picked for egg laying. So from this, napier grass then became um, the trap plant of choice. 
Unfortunately, this is a strain where the mother doesn't know what's good for the babies. Uh, even though the nepegra is preferred for egg laying, the emerging larvae, the young ones of the pest, don't appreciably survive on nepegras. Within the first 20 days, you have over 80% mortality of the young ones. So the mother picking what is not good for, for the babies, which is this is really good for us because then we can trap the pest on the trap plant, then it does not uh, meaningfully survive. So it reduces pest pollution significantly. Good news is that within the adapted push pull system that uses uh, um, mulatto truth bracaria, that fall armyworm moths will lay eggs on bracaria, but the larvae will not feed on it. So you have um, the pest trapped um, within the trap plant. But why would some plants be more attractive for egg laying um, uh, to the moth relative to others? Maize, for example, maize, napier grass, um, bracaria, all these are grasses. They belong to the grass family. So you would assume that all grasses would produce similar smell and would equally be attractive to the pest. We discovered that uh, within the first three hours of uh, nightfall, there's a sudden increase in the amount of volatiles um, coming out of nepia grass compared to maize. And this is not just only with nep nepia grass. These grasses produce serious amounts, a significant increase in the amount of these volatiles as soon as uh, darkness sets in. And Coincidentally, that is the, the time during which the moths, the pests, uh, fly around looking for plants to lay eggs on. So what that means is within the time that these pests are highly uh, um, active looking for host plants, this plant becomes more visible smell-wise to the pest. So um, the pest lands on it and lays more eggs on it. Maize also does a similar thing. It will produce some of this uh, beneficial compound because it is the smell that attracts uh, an insect to a plant. Um, and the key compounds we identified that are important in this in this smell. The smell is a blend of different compounds. So the key ones that are elevated in amounts that are released uh, during the first three hours of nightfall, and that is when the pest uh, um, then sees smell-wise these plants and lay eggs on them. And uh, there are also certain plants that are not just liked by the insect by the smell that the plants produce. Now we identified the push plant. Initially, the push plant of choice was. Uh, um, molasses grass. But later, as we carried on with the research, we identified plants belonging to the group, uh, the genus Desmodium, the beautiful uh, plant that you see there. Desmodium is producing smell from the leaves that don't attract the insects. Not, not only do not attract the insects, but are repugnant to the insect. The insects are very um, keen in identifying compounds that are attractive or repellent. So Desmodium is uh, uh, um, a repellent plant because of the smell that it produces. So the insect tends to avoid it. So that's that's the push component of this. But while these compounds repel, while this smell repels um, um, the host, the, 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 the insect, this smell is attractive to the natural enemies of the pest. So they, they, they provide a twin, twin function. The smell that pushes away the pest is the same smell or a group of compounds, a blend that's attractive to natural enemies. So while the pest pollutions are lower, the rate of parasitism of the pests that uh, land on the plant is very high. So you have the pest pushed away, but the remnants in here are, are, are attacked by the natural enemies um, that then deal, deal with the pest. So this is a, a rather scary slide, but this is basically the chemistry of push pull. The companion plants that release compounds that are repellent to the pest, the, the trap plant that release compounds that are attractive to the pest, the root chemistry of desmodium that suppress trigger weed, but then this overall system also has additional benefits. We've understood the chemistry uh, uh, that delivers this pest control, and now we're exploiting this for management of all armyworm. Now, when the pest invaded Africa, we were surprised because the first thing that we, we encountered was the fact that this pest would survive on any on up to 100 different plant species. Pushpool is a diversity of different plants. So we thought that it, it would find home in a pushpool field where you have a diversity you have the maize, you have the napier grass, you have the desmodium, and farmers also are integrating common bean into this system. So you have a diversity of plants in one area that would provide a suitable home for this pest. So we thought probably that would mark the end of pushpool as, as a pest management approach uh, for small scale farmers in Africa. But then we started receiving reports from farmers and from national extension agencies that it's only pushful fields that are remaining clean um, um, in the farmers, the, the farmers' context. So we went and uh, did studies, and we identified that yes, this was actually happening. In the pushful fields, there were significantly lower uh, proportions of plants that were damaged by the pest. There were significantly lower uh, larvae of folamium, um 
attacking attacking the plant. At the same time, farmers actually expressed the satisfaction that push pull was actually reducing um, the damage caused by fall on their on, on the maize. So this was really really good news to us. And so we wanted to understand exactly the dynamics of uh, of, of pest control, fall alarm control um, um, through push pull. And so our studies have, have confirmed that the chemistry that uh, provides the repellents to stem borer moths is the same chemistry that provides the push to fall amium um, adult stage. So the adult stage does not like the smell, so to speak, that is uh, um, emitted by desmodium. So that provides the push. And when they land on uh, the trap plant, the eggs hatch into larvae within, within three uh, to five days. And the larvae don't survive, um, they don't feed on, on, on the trap plant. And at the same time, um, the natural enemy activity that is within the system also helps deal with the problem. And this is based on earlier studies that we conducted. Initially, we wanted to find out what exactly push pull does in terms of enhancing the ecological integrity of the cropping system. And within the push pull fields, there's a high abundance and diversity of natural enemies that help deal with the pests. In addition to the push and pull components of the technology, there's a diversity of beneficial arthropods that also help lower the pest populations. And we've identified key uh, uh, predator groups that are actively helping reduce populations of fallen um, in this cropping system um, push pull. Additionally, um, we discovered that there is another functionality of push pull in terms of reducing pest, pest load on the maize. For example, that if you're growing your maize, next to um, a push plant like molasses grass, the picture on the right that you see, there's an induction of defense in some maize varieties. We call them maize, uh, smart maize. These are maize varieties that have defense system that's inducible either by the smell of a repellent plant around it or by egg laying of the pest. So we discovered that the fact that there's a push plant intimately planted with maize that induces the defense response in the neighboring maize that then leads to attraction of parasitoids that then attack the, the pests that land on the maize. So you have a diversity of, of, of activities going on. There's a push and pull that controls the pest through the stimulant strategy, but then there's also the plant signaling where the push plant is inducing a defense response in the maize, it's a smart maize variety planted, and this maize then becomes attractive to the natural enemies of the pest. So that also helps reduce the pest load. And we've understood the chemistry of how, how this happens. But then, Additionally, what happens is that push pull through the uh, activity of desmodium improves soil health in various ways. Desmodium is one of the most efficient nitrogen fixing legumes. At the same time, there's also improvement in, uh, in soil organic carbon. At the same time, there's also the improvement soil, soil organic matter content of the soil. Um, what this does then, it prevents leaching of nutrients um, into layers, that then the, the plants cannot uh, utilize them. But additionally, it also improves plant vigor, plant growth and vigor. This plant then becomes, um, is, able to, is able to compensate for leaf damage by, by a lot of these pests that feed on the leaves. So while you have the beneficial chemistry delivering the pest control, the soil improvement functionality of this technology also improves plant vigor, and this plant then can, can compensate better due to, um, due to the, the faster growth of the plant, then utilization of the nutrients allows this plant to survive and compensate for damage caused to the leaves. Farmers are happy with this. If you look at the photo that is there, this is one farmer in Western Kenya. That was the field or the field looked like before adoption of push pull. And this is what she's become. Not only the crop has improved in health, the farmer also looks healthier and uh, probably, probably happier. Now, like I already said, this, the, the component plants um, are beneficial fodder. So this system allows farmers to be able to generate fodder from within the uh, small uh, lands and it integrates this with the livestock. So the livestock component provides additional milk and income sources. So this farmer is able to intimately uh, do both crop and, and, and livestock cultivation. We have packaged the technology in a manner that allows different pathways to, to farmers to gain uh, access to this, the information about technology through various pathways. We use uh, print media, we use farm field days, we use uh, radio, participatory video. We have farmers that are trained to offer training to fellow farmers either through field schools and, and also through, um, through farmer teachers. Now, what are we currently doing uh, within the push-pull system? We know that now we have a technology that's delivering all these benefits. What you want to do is to be able to make it uh, um, available to as many farmers as possible. At the same time, complete the understanding of the chemistry through which uh, this beneficial effect of Folamam uh, control is delivered. But we also want to make it a much 
the smarter technology by identifying trap plants specifically that would uh, enhance uh, um, the suppression of this pest um, so that we have a smarter push pull in terms of delivering not only the pest control uh, with regards to stem borers but also just for lamb arms. We're studying the whole strength of for lamb arms. A new pest to us, we want to understand uh, the key um, host plant that. Uh, determine its policy dynamics in Africa. We now know that it prefers maize to any other any other crop. But if you get if you remove the maize from the question, the second plant that it prefers uh, significantly is, is, is sorghum. So if you told farmers not to grow maize and switch sorghum, they would, it will still find home um, home in, in sorghum. And additionally, we also want to understand the plant plant signaling and how we can make this uh, a more a more usable technology for farmers to manage the pest. We also know that landscape complexity. Uh, the diversity of, of 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 structures and landscape will determine effectiveness of some, some of these control uh, uh, methods. We know that if you push push pull within a place that is highly diverse in terms of additional host plants, then the technology become becomes more effective. So, what is the role of landscape complexity that we can take advantage of to be able to help us uh, make uh, fall on control more more effective? And of course, we also still uh, pursuing uh, um, additional component plants that can be used uh, in, in terms of enhancing the the natural enemy um, populations and diversity. Now, push pull and nutshell then deliver some of these some uh, key, some of the key uh, um, benefits. It will control stem borers because uh, fall armworm does not just exist in isolation, and fall armworm uh, belongs to um, the same order and family. And some of the stem borers that have been here with us, uh, notably one of them is uh, the Busiola fusca, it's an African indigenous uh, stem borer species. So. Um, for Lamom has very close relatives uh, with us. So the technology is able to not only uh, deliver what we described, but also control stem borders, it will control striker, it will provide fodder. It also helps with the climate change and adaptation mitigation because when you improve the soil, uh, the ability of the soil to sequester carbon, then also helps mitigate the effect of climate change. Because I've talked about for control, but because of, of the, 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 the damages that are not coming in, we have. Uh, we have uh, uh, demonstrated that push will also helps uh, uh, control uh, ear rots and mycotoxin. And of course, I've talked about soil health improvement. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the donors that uh, the various donors that provide uh, uh, support to ECP, including Barbishan, European Union, um, CEDA, all, all these that are, that, are, that are showing in here. And thank you very much. I am now free to answer any questions sure. that uh, okay. might be. So, um... Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I mean, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, comments coming in thanking you for, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Um, Charles, I mean, uh, a lot of, uh, a huge amount of detail there, and I think it, it shows how you're able to build on this wealth of, uh, of, of past experience in terms of the research that's done already, and I think that's, that's really wonderful. Um, so we've got quite a number of questions, and, and I'd, I'd like to start off um, with one which is coming in from a number of people, from uh, Pierre Sylvie, John Coman as well, and I see somebody else, uh, um, Charles uh, Kaguri, all, all uh, complimenting you, but saying, Charles, Charles uh, Kaguri says, but I presume this is only suitable for, for small plot sizes. So how, how effective would this be in larger scale farming if we're talking about um, yeah, bigger fields, and obviously then not so much in the way of field boundaries. Uh, th thank you very much. That's a question that, has, that, has, that I've, uh, I've had to answer um, many platforms, and very valid. Maybe uh, you might have stop sharing your screen, because I'm. I think I'm present on your screen now as well, from the looks of things. Oh, uh, so you think I should stop sharing? You stop your screen sharing, then we can maybe see you. Uh, okay, let me just see how this, this works. I, I keep getting lost on this. Um, but it worked perfectly, so that was brilliant. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me just see how I... Okay, stop sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's come up. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. Push-pull was developed um, for a typical small-scale farmer. Um, if you want to control, because uh, it handles a lot of different uh, constraints, if you want to control uh, striker only, then it can go as, as large as you can, because then there's no push and pull dynamics. It's only what is happening uh, through the root system of Desmodium. So that doesn't require the, 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 the above ground chemistry. But we've shown that if you have only the push component, then you can have this, you can have this in a 50 by 50 meter plot. 
If you want to control folamion, where we've demonstrated that the most uh, important component of this approach is the push plant, then far you can take it. If you want to control uh, serial stem borers, then if you're working within, because then the, 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 the component, the, the, the trap plant is highly attractive to the stem borer moth. In that case, then if you have a 50 by 50 meter plot, you can have the push, but you can extend it um, to a little over, I think, 100 meters, and then this will still be active. So it's largely a small scale farmer, small farmer's technology, depending on, on which actual constraint you want to deal with. So there's a, an intriguing question here from uh, Godfrey Apangu, who's saying, um, what about the neighboring farmers? So if a farmer's practicing push-pull, uh, and I guess what's behind this question, will, will you be then pushing the pest into their fields and away from your own? So does this lead to uh, problems in the neighboring fields? <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. It's actually a very valid question, because then you can be pushing to people's farms and they might start uh, taking you to court. Um, <laughs> what, 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 what you've seen is that uh, um, you have the trap land around this intercrop. The trap land is, is, is more attractive to, to the pest than, than the maize, for example. So you end up with this, uh, um, the, 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 the pest on the trap land and they cannot survive and cannot multiply on the trap land, so they, they'll die there. What we've seen is that if you have a push-pull farmer in a locality, and the neighbor is not doing anything about uh, um, control of striga, then that becomes a source of reinfestation of the farmer's field. We've been asked this question over and over. They're going to have push-pull to control striga, for example, for a period of, uh, say, six years, because we've shown that it can actually deplete seed bank within six years. I'm sorry about uh, going into striga, because this should have been for, about for Lanham, but just so that you understand the different dynamics of, of that question. If you have a neighbor not doing this, then you can deplete your soil of striga seed, but if your neighbor is not doing this, then that farm will act as a source from which the seeds then will reinvade your farm. But in, term, in, term, in, term, in terms of uh, control of uh, the pests, then the pests get trapped, get trapped on uh, yeah. the trap land. So and, uh, that leads a bit to another question that came in uh, actually earlier that we had ahead of the, the conference today, which is really saying, don't you need to actually combine this with a landscape approach? Uh, given the fact that fall armyworm, I mean, can really travel very large distances. We've seen that in terms of the speed at which it's spread through the African continent. Uh, so doesn't it need, if you like, I mean, obviously this works extremely well at that small scale on, on the small farms, but, but how do you incorporate that into a broader approach? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the last slides, I think in one of the last slides that I presented, I talked about incorporating the landscape components in, 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 in management of fallen worm. And like you rightly pointed out, you know, this pest can fly several kilometers in one night. And, and if you have a technology like this, how then do you take advantage of the complexity component of a landscape to help deal with the, the, this, this, this uh, flight trend of the pest? What you've seen with the stem borers, including a relative of fallen worm, the Busuela fusca, is that if you put push pull in, uh, a, a moderately complex landscape. And moderately complex in this case is uh, a landscape that has um, a certain level, degree of complexity in terms of uh, abundance and diversity of other grasses. So you have some, so you have a relative moderate size of space that is covered by the grasses and not uh, maize or sorghum, then it becomes more effective than when it's in, in, in a less diverse landscape. Now, um, what we are doing now is we're looking at infestation of this uh, this pest in different fields, in different landscape complexities. Because once we know what landscape complexity does in terms of pest uh, levels in these farms, then we can um, begin to integrate a management approach within some of these some of these complexity uh, dynamics. Okay, so you you mentioned sorghum there. There was a question here from uh, Paul uh, Paul Wagstaff, who said he met a, a farmer in Zambia who is planting sweet sorghum varieties around maize. Um, and we're suggesting that that was pulling fall armyworm away from the maize. So, so do you have any um, experience of uh, the use of sweet sorghum varieties as, uh, as um, trap crops? No, no, no. We've, we've not worked on sweet sorghum, but we've worked on um, 
I mean, you, you, you actually well conversant with the cropping systems in Western Kenya. They just the regular sorghum that farmers grow, the, the, the land races and the hybrids and all they have from Kenya seed particularly. And and it shows that if you give a choice between maize and sorghum, the pest, it will just attack the maize. You'd have about 80% attack on the maize rather than what you'd have on sorghum. So, but we've not tested the uh, um, um, sweet sorghum. But again, if you remove the maize, then attack in terms of egg laying and feeding on sorghum is as high as you'd find on maize. So if you remove the maize from the equation, sorghum is seriously attacked. But this is interesting that sweet sorghum could be having, having a, a more attractive uh, uh, um, emission of volatiles compared to maize. Uh, we are yet to find out that we, 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 we'll look into it. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to, um, oh, well, maybe one other question before we move on, and then I'll, I'll, I'd like to bring um, Isaac back into the discussion. So um, the questions here about adoption coming in, um, trying to understand how, uh, how widespread has been the uptake of push-pull already. Um, and linked to that, Hugh Gosnell's asking is, is um, what are the costs to implement for a, a, a small-scale farmer in a one-hectare field? Um, adoption figures. Now we have about 207,000 farmers uh, planting pushpull, and these are distributed in Kenya, um, Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, in Malawi, Zimbabwe, Burkina Faso, um, Rwanda. So in about countries now, and uh, we expect adoption to increase because of two reasons. One, no, three reasons. One, um, initially the adoption rates were lower because uh, farmers were asking the question. That we've typically uh, intercropped our, our maize with beans. There's more than takes the place of beans, and so we've lost our bean. But you, uh, through research, adaptive research with farmers, we've now re uh, reintroduced bean into the system. So you can actually plant your common bean within the pushful system, either with maize in the same hole or in between two maize plants uh, within a row. So that, that constant is addressed. Number two, uh, the seed was the issue, seed of the component plants, truly there's more seeds. Uh, one, they're not easy to get. Number two, they're a little expensive. But now we've addressed the seed system. We have local seed companies producing and marketing seed. That has been addressed. Number three, now there's a huge demand for push pull with the invasion of fall armyworm. So uh, because of that increased uh, um, demand for, 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 for the technology, we've expanded our partnerships. We've expanded our partnerships. We have about 25 partners now uh, across across those countries that are taking this push pull uh, this technology to as many farmers as possible. So we expect adoption adoption rates to increase. Um, the cost of planting push pull, um, the Smodium seed still costs about um, about we are using cost now to about fifteen dollars a kilo, and with that you can plant an acre. Um, what farmers do is that once you've bought a small quantity of desmodium seed, you can plant in your small field and use vines to spread or to expand your field. At the same time, your neighboring farmers can get uh, um, vines from you and establish the push field as long as the distance is not far and the moisture levels in the soil are high. Uh, the component plants as well, uh, we've addressed the seed of uh, mulatto, mulatto to the current uh, uh, push plant we're using, no, pull plant we're using in a lot of places because of climate change and it's highly drought and highly valuable as fodder. We have the local production now going on and it would cost more or less about $10 a kilo. With that, you can also plant, easily plant an acre and use root splits to expand. So that is essentially what it costs. And these are, these are perennial plants, once you plant them, you, you don't have to plant again. It's a one season investment and you have the benefits uh, for as long as you want to keep your field. It's quite interesting when I see the, uh, the, the questions coming in because some, some obviously people are, are reflecting back on their own experience. We have the questions pushing for, uh, you know, how could you use this in, in larger scale farming? Uh, there's a question now here from uh, Yodit uh, Kibede who's working in a very uh, land constrained part of Ethiopia and saying one of the constraints to adoption there is actually the space taken by napier grass uh, and the farmers being reluctant to devote more of their land actually to the trap crops. I don't know if that's something you've experienced as well in the areas you've been working, Charles? I'm actually glad that uh, that has been raised. Um, we noticed that, uh, I mean, from various studies, we've, we've, we've shown that, because uh, initially there was an allegation that uh, you can only practice push pull when you have livestock, that then you'll feed on the fodder. But our studies indicated that it did not matter whether you had livestock or not. But what we are doing now to address some of these issues is 
commercializing the fodder component technology to act as a driver for adoption of, of push pull. So it is an actually a, a, a technology that we provide fodder for you. You can feed your animal or commercialize this in, in, into a marketable product. So we've not we've not encountered situation where farmers are saying, "I cannot expand. I cannot expand. Uh, uh, I cannot use land for 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 napier grass." The only thing that needs to be done is a technology that depends on capacity building, training the farmers on the utilization of the fodder component of of the technology. I guess that would depend on having a, a, a market for fodder in the area while you're working. I'd like to bring um, Isaac back into the discussion now, Isaac, so maybe if you can also unmute and I'll be trying to, uh, to field yeah. some questions to both of you. Well, first of all, I should say that our third speaker for today, uh, Prasanna um, Bodupali from, from Simit, who's going to talk on breeding, uh, won't be able to join us actually, so uh, we'll hope to be able to fit him in uh, tomorrow. Um, we've been expecting him to speak today, but that gives us, uh, I think we'll probably take another five to ten minutes for questions. There was an intriguing question uh, coming up. Um, I think it was uh, yeah, John, John Coman who, who actually asked, well, why can't we combine the two technologies? So is uh, the use of BT varieties, wouldn't that actually strengthen the, uh, the push-pull technology? So maybe, uh, Isaac, first over to you. Well, thank you very much. I think we've been talking about a holistic approach to solving the following one problem. The BT technology that I spoke about is just another tool in a toolbox. If there's a way to bring all these uh, tools together to help the growers, the one thing we have to take into consideration is also the cost. When we are bringing too many technologies together, that will have a pronounced effect on the grower. So if there's a way that we can bring the technologies together. Yes, I mean, if there's something that can pull, bring the fall worm into the BT and then the BT will uh, control that, that will be fine. But at the same time, I think we have to be careful not to overburden the, the growers. And uh, yeah, it is, it's something that can be discussed, but we have to also be careful. Um, pushing uh, back you, you know, the question that was coming in earlier, which was uh, a question which was actually saying, but how relevant is this, uh, is this technology, going back to the BT for small scale farming in Africa? I mean, you, you push it okay. the cost. So is there a, um, I mean, and we know that many, many small scale farmers do actually use uh, hybrid varieties of maize, but is there a large premium, price premium in terms of the BT varieties compared to others? Do you see this as something that could be deployed at scale in small scale farming? Uh, that's a very good question, question that people have asked. And uh, I just want to use Philippines as an example. Philippines, the farmers are small scale grow, uh, farm holders that we have in Africa, and you will be surprised, amazed at the adoption rate. So the deployment of the trade to Africa will be different from the way it is deployed here in the uh, developing countries. And I think that's something that can be worked out by the technology providers and those who are in Africa. The idea is not to go and, you know, make the premium very high, but an affordable premium, premium that will help the growers. So it's something that the technology providers, uh, you know, think about and they don't want a situation whereby they're making, you know, the technology too expensive for those who are in Africa. It's working very well in all these more uh, developing countries. And, uh, and I think the same model will be applied to Africa. If you go to South Africa, for example, uh, a lot of the growers, they are buying the PT seeds and uh, I think they are happy with what they buy and they are happy with the income that accrues from uh, that technology. So the same uh, model, the same practice will be extended to other parts of Africa that are interested in uh, assessing this uh, technology. Okay, and, and now maybe if I can push this then back to Charles and, and ask maybe if Charles would like to uh, to comment on, on his opinion as to whether BT would be something good to combine with push-pull. Maybe, Charles? Yeah, yeah, th th thank you, Ken. Um, let me just give you a, a bit of a background. Uh, part of my PhD studies were looking at um, 
how how push pull and BT maze could be combined. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I, ha I had to do this in South Africa because uh, that was the closest I could get to um, to a BT field. And and at that point, uh, the, the the what I had in mind um, was that uh, eventually our hypothesis that was that stem borers would develop resistance to BT maze. Under natural field conditions, a very small proportion of stem borders actually survive from egg to adult stage. Now, if you are to reduce this population that is getting exposed to BT toxin, then we'd extend the duration within which then BT maize would remain relevant for pest management. So in terms of pest management, yes, it makes all sense to then combine this. And for an interior management approach for pests like for uh, you want to look at uh, different things. One, you look at you want to look at the cost, like Isaac has said, because eventually, you know, maize remains a low value crop. Um, so if you want to raise the cost of production to levels that then farmers cannot make an economic sense of it, then it will not be um, a useful approach to them. Then you look at the complementarity. Um, there are various components that deliver pest management, so to speak. If you look at uh, you know, push pull, you have the push and pull chemistry. You have the, the part of that chemistry bringing in natural enemies. You have these component plants building resilience um, of, of, of the system, but also uh, the vigor of the plant its ability to to deal with the with the pest damages. So looking at the different components that be compatible, but will still deliver a management approach that is economically feasible to the farmers. So yes, in terms of science, it makes perfect sense to combine uh, some of these approaches. But in terms of application, I think combining push pull and BT would uh, be overburdening to the um, to the farmers. At the same time, we also need to look at the effect of that would have on the general um, health of the ecosystem in terms of natural enemy um, survival and 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 and, and activity. So <clears throat> maybe to to continue. Yeah. With you, sorry, Isaac, you want to begin? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, in terms of uh, natural enemies, NTOs, I think there's a wide, a lot of studies that have been done to show that BT has no effect on natural or non-target organisms. It's specific. So in terms of the abundance of that, it, it, these are genes that are targeted to specific insects. So if you have BT in an environment, studies have even shown that it increases, uh, uh, you know, the natural enemy. So I think we need to get that uh, that point clear that uh, BT does not affect uh, natural enemies in the environment. So, so Isaac, I mean, you're, you're arguing basically that the insect has got to land on the maize plant and start eating it before it gets killed. Is that is that correct? No, uh, uh, you. Uh, you know, insects are highly specialized. Some of them can sense that this is a BT crop, even from flying into the uh, into the uh, the field, and then they take a bite. Yeah, they, you have to take a bite before it works. So they take that bite, nimble, and then they die off. So that's 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 required. The insect has to take okay. a bite. Yeah. So Charles, do you want to come back on that at all? It seems to be a point of uh, not one hundred percent agreement. Um, no, uh, probably, probably not. Um, you know, this is this is, and I think I think Isaac Isaac holds the the the, the final say on this. Um, the thing that we observed in South Africa was such that uh, there was higher survival, um, with basically survival of. Uh, Busiola fusca, which is an indigenous uh, species, similar species, the high survival rates on the silk and the tassel of BT maize. Um, that is really part, part of part of the, the the reason that led to um, resistance of the pest to um, to the BT toxin in South Africa, and that was based on Mon eight ten event. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. And, and, sorry, so let me just finish. And, and like, like Isaac will tell you that if, if, if you follow the, the resist insect or whatever, the, 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 the laid down procedures of doing a BT uh, crop, one is that you'll use a refuge, uh, a refuge system. What you've done in Kenya is that you try to look at 
the natural refuge system that, that would, point, would, would be part of, um, yes, in case BT maize was released in, 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 in Kenya, would we have enough grasses acting as natural refuge if, or, or refugia? The science is beautiful, um, that then you'd find emerging population from, recent population from a BT crop mating with susceptible uh, 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 population from the refuge, and then you end up with the heterozygous insect that can still be killed by a higher dose of, of the toxin. Okay. Uh, beautifully, that would happen uh, uh, if you could control movements of this, these insects. But if you have uh, um, them mating between themselves, and also you have these rates of survival that are higher in, uh, in certain parts of plants where the toxin is not highly expressed, then you have higher survival rates. So, but, but uh, uh, Isaac is the authority in this. Um, okay. So, I mean, obviously, I, I, I think the, the nice thing I take away from this actually is that um, even with the BT, which we think is just a straightforward, simple solution, we still have to think how we uh, manage the system to make sure that we don't uh, encourage the buildup of natural resistance. And I think that's, that's uh, an important point that Isaac made earlier as well. I, I've got a couple of other questions that I don't want to miss on. There's a question from uh, Namakanda, Namakanda um, Matamola, and, and it a, sounds a bit, but how can a, a, a simple farmer manage such a complex system, Charles? It, it's, um, you know, push-pull, it's, it's beautiful, but it seems very intricate. How can a simple farmer manage it? And, and maybe I can link that to a question that I've actually uh, posed myself to Zayakan, your colleague, earlier as well, is how, how do farmers actually adapt and modify the system? Because my experience is farmers usually take on technologies and, and they mix them and match them in a, in a slightly different way than they're, they're first of all presented. And that's often a very good evidence of them being uh, adapted and adopted, if you like, within farming systems. So uh, sort of two sides of the same coin, really, Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Ken. Um, I think one of the key things that has been going for push-pull as a cropping system is that it's modeled alongside the small-scale farmer's way of cropping. Small-scale farmers don't just grow maize as a monocrop or sorghum as a monocrop. The intercrop is also all sorts of uh, legumes, for example. So, so uh, because push-pull is a similar polycropping system that involves intercropping that they used to, but then essentially using locally available materials, so to speak, that um, so the, the only thing that the technology does is that uh, it provides a rearrangement of these commonly available plants to deliver pest management. So it actually depends on two things: proper establishment of these component plants and their management. And so um, it's a technology that's built on the skill of the farmer. And as we have a, a long range of people that provide training to the farmers, but this is not different from your typical intercropping system. The only thing is that now you're adding a trap plant around it. You're planting desmodium there, you plant your common bean or anything in between the rows of maize, but then you also have a trap plant around it. So it is, it is you know, small-scale farmers in Africa have always done intercropping. So the only thing we've done is that now we've introduced a new way of planting napier grass around doing before around this intercrop, but still maintaining the modern between the rows of maize, like the, the volumes planted planted across between the cereal rows. Now, in terms of um, adapting and adopting the technology, one of the key questions that came to us initially was that now you've given us this technology, how can we then modify it in a manner that will suit us? And the first question uh, of this nature came to us from a place called Vihiga. The land size is a very small, and, and every piece of that land is critically important. So we gave them a free hand, that depending on, because they also keep livestock, so depending on how much fodder you want, you can extend the rows. You can do two rows of trap land, you can do four rows, depending on the space you have and your fodder requirement. Number two, in terms of managing desmodium in between the rows, because these farmers use desmodium as a beautiful protein source for, for the animals. If you give the your animals one part of desmodium and three parts of the grass, then you increase your milk output significantly. So one of the key things we have to train them is that you don't trim all of it. So farmers have tried to uh, devise ways of managing, but it remains, it still maintains integrity, such that you can, you can, you can still be able to deliver uh, the beneficial pest uh, management effects and utilize the fodder plant. So the adaptation that has been there has been just in uh, determining the number of rows of uh, the trap plant that you have to have, depending on your space and your need and management of the intercrop in between the rows of, of, of the cereal. Okay. 
<clears throat> um, one more last uh, uh, sort of technical question. I think, in a sense, this this sort of harks at us researchers. We're always looking for problems with things. But uh, Catherine Cameron is asking: some species of Desmodium are actually invasive of, in in Africa. So, is there a risk that farmers will plant an invasive species that will then have some negative effects? That's a, that's a very valid question. Um, it is true that. Uh, some species of Desmodium are actually invasive. Not only in, Af in some parts of Africa, but also in places like Queensland, Australia. So what we've done is that, uh, you know, this research has gone through several phases. Uh, one was screening, like when we're trying to adapt push pull to dry areas, we had to screen at least 32 different accessions of Desmodium that belong to about 12 different species. And we're looking at key things. One is, does it survive uh, harsh environmental conditions? Number two, does it have the right growth habit that it can be used as uh, as an intercrop because some of them some of these, these grow as shrubs and number three what is the potential of this plant becoming becoming invasive one of the key things that uh, that that i like about push food and it's in the sense that it allows you manage desmodium in a manner that would be better for you than anybody that's not using this technology desmodium uh, invasive species of desmodium out there so the species that we use are those that have been selected one for suitability as an intercrop number two the relevance to these cropping systems in terms of providing fodder and improving soil health, and again, easy to manage. So the ones that we use are not invasive and they've been selected purely for their value in pest management. But even more importantly, Pushpool as a package has a very strong training component on how you plant and manage that plant, how you plant, manage and utilize that plant. So there's no chance of this plant ever becoming becoming um, uh, a problem. Okay. Um... You know, I love legumes anyway, so great to see these legumes uh, as an important component there. Um, maybe one last question. This is now from my side, and it's one I've also posed at Isipe in the past. I mean, given the fact you guys have been working on, on Pushpool generally now, I think, for, for a good 10 years, and I mean, we've, we've, we've had such fantastic stories basically on the sites. I mean, it, it's uh, one of the most beautiful integrated systems that I can really think of. Isn't it a surprise that there's only 200,000 farmers using the technology? Or does that actually hint that it is a bit more complex for adoption than we might imagine? Um, thank you very much, Ken. Um, as you asked the question, I remembered another uh, component of the answer that I was giving that I left out. Um, that interestingly, the Desmodium species that we use in Pushpool are actually already introduced in Africa much earlier. So we're basically taking advantage of what it was already introduced here and providing a better a better way of, of utilizing and managing it. Now, um, you're right. Um, you'd expect the pushpool being such a, a beautiful uh, cropping system that you'd have every small scale farmer in in this um, constraint prone areas to to be practicing it. But like I already said, um, and you know this, and some of the papers that I read that I enjoy reading the most, uh, your own works uh, can. Uh, technology adoption is such an intricate uh, um, science. There are several determinants of whether farmers will take up something or not. There are those who will try it out and disadopt. There are those who would uh, uh, still wait for other farmers to just see how it performs in their farms before they take it up. But for us, the key challenge that we had were uh, addressing the issue of the seed. You know, even to date, we are not able to meet every need for the seed. The demand is so huge that the seed companies are grappling with, uh, with the production of the seed and the marketing systems. So um, it was uh, the question of, can you then provide the component plants that we need, particularly the seed? So that's now uh, 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 addressed. And we expect the, the, the adoption rates to increase significantly because uh, places like Ethiopia, the government has taken it up and is promising that at least 20,000 farmers should take it every cropping season. And now we have had more partners coming on the ground to demand the technology that they, they, they disseminated. People, most of come on board. So we expect this uh, the adoption rates to increase. But we are also looking at um, the intricate intricacies in technology adoption because we want to use a push pull as a, uh, to showcase what it is that determines technology adoption. How do you adopt, or what's the adoption process of such a, uh, um, a complex technology that then can be used by other workers as, as a way of trying to understand uh, technology adoption in areas where they work. Excellent. So there's a final comment. I mean, we're getting some very positive comments from people thanking you both for some excellent talks and from excellent discussion. There's a, a, a final comment here from, from Mr. Singh, who's saying it would be very interesting to understand how Pushpool 
can be adapted to, to suit different contexts in future, and I think that's something we'll be looking forward to hearing about in, in, uh, in the future. I'm going to bring the discussion to a close now. We've been going uh, for nearly uh, an hour and a half. Um, we hope then to bring uh, you the talk of uh, Prasanna uh, on uh, breeding for resistance, the fall army worm tomorrow in the final session. And in that final session tomorrow as well, we, we hope to have um, uh, some pitches basically from uh, some technology, fall army worm uh, technology award finalists who, who were coming up with some uh, innovative ideas of how to uh, address fall army worm. But I'd uh, like to thank on everybody's behalf then, um, to thank Isaac and to thank Charles for, for really excellent, very clear uh, presentations and for uh, handling the discussion so well. So thanks to you and to thanks to everybody for joining. And